total world population is about 6 million. Half living in city, one third living in slums. This figure has doubled from 1960, when urban population was less than 1 billion out of a total figure of 3 billion. No more than one fifth was estimated to live in slums at that time. Demography experts predict that population will be around 9 billion in year 2050. Two thirds living in urban areas. And no reasonable prediction is available for slums. History shows that water is a key factor of urbanization. Springs and the river played a fundamental role in determining where one could settle and where we are settled now. Water availability is expected to be a major control of man's life in the next future of a planet Earth. The daily municipal water withdrawal ranges from 80 to 150 liters per person in China, India and Brazil cities. Can they pretend to get more than 600 liters as a US citizen currently does? The impact of natural disasters such as storms and floods is strongly linked to increasing vulnerability associated with urbanization. Are the state-of-the-art mitigation policy effective in reducing this impact? in both terms of human casualties and economic damage. These and other similar questions are fundamental to address ideological science and engineering hydrology in next years. The year 2010 Henry Darcy Medal Lecture will approach some open problems arising from the impact of increasing urbanization on the water cycle and mostly the associated feedback on human life. I usually start my lectures to undergraduate students, quote and Borges. I told them that the hydrological cycle is a matter of science, but it is also poetic and exciting. Mysterious. You find water in any poetry from the beginning of human history. So, folks, my talk will be an intimate talk rather than a general lecture. Sorry for those expecting some visionary research issue. Jane of Flood in year 1970 was my first flood. It occurred in my hometown when I was a teenager and I knew nothing about hydrology and water engineering. Zooming on Genoa, one cannot see the rivers. Where did the rivers go? Underground. From the inundation map, one sees that this annual is not a surfer river anymore, but it was forced into a big culvert Unfortunately, the width was drastically reduced, as shown by this print dating year 1802. Really, it was the first application of the linear reservoir concept to evaluate the design flood. What we have ever learned? An understanding of how floodplains are formed should make it obvious that a channel river is not large enough to contain all the water produced by a drainage basin. The documentation on negative events should be perfectly known when approaching landscape planning and civil engineering design. In engineering schools, we cannot accept a reticent silence, nor incomplete or misleading explanations or the difficulties arising from unsuccessful engineering works. The way we are includes my undergraduate dissertation on the limits of growth and the art of predicting. <laughs>
both natural and human processes. Look at the CO2 predictions issued in 1972. If one benchmarks this prediction with current observations, one tells that these predictions are rather poor. But the approach had the role of opening the door to future research on rational prediction methods of both natural and anthropogenic processes. It doesn't matter who the physicist is, or how smart he or she is, or how she or he came up with a new law. If it disagrees with the experiment, then it is wrong. Folks, nobody accepts the model as true, except this modeler. Everyone accepts the data as true, except its catcher. Modern hydrology is an observational science uh, that originated after the late 17th century confutation of current theories of springs and the river origin. The problem was to explain runoff and its variability at a riverside. The basic understanding at the time was that one must consider a much larger spatial scale, that is the drainage basin instead of a river cross section. And one must consider a combination of physical processes, that is precipitation, infiltration, transpiration, evaporation and diversion, not only flow. If one had to explain runoff and its variability at a river site. Further studies, based on matching theory with observation, focused on component processes, so establishing the basic knowledge of water movement and storage. Darcy, though, is an example. This led to develop water technology during the 19th and 20th century. In the last 40 years, hydrology emerged as a distinct geoscience under a manifold challenge. This includes the expansion of process variables, the extension of a special and temporal scales of analysis, and the understanding of process interactions over a wide range of space and time scales. These issues are surprisingly similar to those pioneered by modern hydrology. This of a never-ending challenge of hydrology, indeed. Hydrology has developed slowly because it has been considered an appendage of hydraulic engineering rather than a natural science. In practice, Hydrology is regarded mostly as a technological discipline rather than a science. This attitude is responsible for much bad science in hydrology which in turn has led to much bad technology in applied disciplines. Someone is going to end up with an understanding of a relation of a physical basis for statistical variability in time and space. The analysis carried out on the flood occurred in the Ocilia in year 1996 indicates the need for expansion of process variables. In spite of the extreme storm recorded there, the key factor in determining the disaster was wind filled, jointly with that of special distribution of forest. I found similar example in the same years in Spain. The investigation of a flood occurred in Arezzo in year 1934 gave a chance of extending space and time scales of the analysis. This is another river modified by man in the early 20th century. There is a strong narrowing of the natural river channel, of course. 
hydrography is absolutely the product of men's work there. The Canale Mesa della Chiana was a great water project for land reclamation and flood control. It joins the Tevere and the Arno rivers. The Tevere River was partially diverted into the Arno River during the 18th century. This involved huge waterworks, also displaying fine architecture. Going deeper in the analysis, one can reconstruct the ancient hydrography using surface and aquifer tomography and groundwater hydrology as well. This shows that the Castro River was modified by man, probably in the Roman age. Nature is much more or less Euclidean than that appearing now. Note that Castrum, that is the current name of the river, means military camp in Latin. Can fire influence water? Process interactions are sometimes surprising. Wildfires can increase flood severity of one order of sides in the transient before vegetation recovery. Desertification risk increases much more by two or three order of size. Voodoo debris provide a fundamental contribution to preservation of riverine and riparian ecosystems. But they can also produce a dramatic impact on bridges and across the floodplain. The mother of all interactions is that with climate. Starting from the end of the 80s, 30 years ago, the investigation of the interactions between climate and hydrology, this including feedbacks of hydrology and climate, has become a popular research area among hydrologists. However, such an interchange would not only require a clear delineation of the interface between hydrology and climatology, but would probably also call for a clearer understanding of the relationship between theory and practice in each of the two areas. Global change hydrology also indicated that we need a new approach which would recognize that a large-scale system can differ from the sum of its individual components and that a forest is not just a collection of trees. And the notion that water is a free good and a free gift of nature is almost outdated 